Hi, Jupiter. Hello. Yeah. So if you, if you just start sort of like giving us an introduction of what Guardians 300 is and how you got involved in it, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, sure. So, so my name is Mick and uh, I, I served in the British Army for 30 years. Uh, I held a, a number of significant appointments whilst I was in the Army. Um, the de facto adjutant to the Royal Army Physical Training Corps, Senior Master at Arms, which is a, quite a mouthful, and also appointments at the, at the Military Academy Sandhurst. My main job was the design of training and the implementation implementation of training. Uh, and of course, my my role included the mental and physical conditioning for soldiers that, that were going into combat. So, so I was very well aware of behavioural conditioning techniques. And um, I spent quite a bit of time when I resigned my commission in the army. I left as a captain, but resigned uh, my commission because I created a system that helped people transition from one mindset to another. We were losing all sorts of um, great recruits. And what we found was that the reason we were losing them was there was no emotional support for them when they made the transition from, from, from one appointment to another or one mindset to another. I, I, I left and, and then went into the world of uh, international sport, I produced a number of Olympians uh, and worked with some international squads in preparation for World Cups, mentored a number of international coaches and at the same time then also uh, put my skills out amongst the corporate sector and worked with lots of senior management teams, boards of directors, doing mindset training, mindset coaching, using the system that I created uh, that, that really led me to resign my commission. When I came back from Asia, I realised that something wasn't right in the UK and Corona had just hit. And um, I, I just saw that we were being behaviourally conditioned exactly the same way that we used to do with the military. And, and so I went to Trafalgar. Uh, I, I heard a few speakers speak and a lot of what they said resonated with me. I went off and I looked at an awful lot of facts. Vicky and I are very much uh, factually based. I like to stay out of the world of imagination because in, in certain situations like combat, imagination can be, can be quite dangerous. So we went into the world of fact and I, I determined that basically things weren't right. We were losing freedoms um, all over the place for no apparent reason, things, law changes, and the application of legislation that didn't make any sense when you consider we were dealing with a virus. And of course, then I watched Boris's UN address of 2019 and realized he was telling us exactly where it was going chapter and verse. At that point, I thought, well, actually, we've got a top down approach at this moment in time. I joined the World Freedom Alliance and, and gave them uh, guidance on, on security and, and strategy for communication. And we were doing lots of top down type stuff, notices of liability, and, and they're all very effective in their own rights. The thing that was missing was a bottom up approach. And that's where the Guardians 300 came in. The Guardians 300 is literally about producing a, uh, a group of people that, that become peace constables. They'll be trained in common law. And, and my intention is to train as many peace constables that exist in the police force. So we have comparable, if not greater numbers. Mm -hmm. So that's a little whistle stop tour of where, where we are at right at this moment in time. For the purposes of keeping the shops open in well yeah the the, 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 the strategies but that that was the introduction wasn't yeah, it sorry yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> so so what would you say would be the role of these peace soldiers basically what would you expect them to do in the day give, give me an idea of what you would expect them to do well they've got they've got different strategies so our main uh our main push as we go forwards is, uh, is one of keeping shops open and businesses open because we know that they're going to lock us down again. That's pretty obvious. Uh, mm. There's no way Boris was ever going to let us out of, of this grip. And what he will do it, he will do it simply incrementally. He'll call it the tier system again. and then. But it will all amount to the same thing. And slowly but surely, he'll put different factions. So he's already started talking about wheeling out soldiers and putting them into Manchester. These are all ways of just desensitizing people to make people believe that this is normal when it's not. It's completely abnormal. You don't see soldiers on the street unless there's a, there's a, there's a real need. And of course, we understand that the reaction to COVID is, is disproportionate. So the peace constables are going to fulfill a number of roles. I don't want to tell you exactly what they do, 
because some of the roles we don't necessarily want to advertise openly. But one of their main functions is going to be that they defend shops that the uh, government try to close so that we can, can maintain a level of business uh, within a community. Okay. So, so mainly it's just to keep the businesses open. You don't see foresee any other roles like um, keeping the peace out on the street or anything like that, no? Well, I mean, a peace constable would, would always assist a, a police constable, actually, if someone was breaking the law. The idea is to complement and, and collaborate wherever we can and, and to do that peacefully and lawfully. Equally, part of our role is to educate the police because at this moment in time, the police have forgotten the basics of law, which, which comes from common law. Common law is the law of the land. Uh, all of the legislation, statutes and acts were introduced later on after common law was, was formed in the Middle Ages. And of course, people think that it's very much a, an ancient law that, that should be forgotten, but in reality still stands true and, and is the highest law in the land. And so part of it is an educational uh, process as well us educating people, us educating shop owners, um, and at the same time connecting the shop owners to a system that is currently outside of this system. Because your average business owner has to close because they are part of the, the maritime system, the statute system. They are subject to that, whereas people that sign up to the common law court, they're not, because they, 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 are, they have their details recorded with, with a common law court, and therefore that puts them outside of, of that, that system of statutes, legislation, and act. Right. But haven't a lot of common law cases failed in the courts? I mean, I, I've, I thought there was a lot of people that d did all this where they, um, they, took, they, they took back their birth certificate, in fact, they got rid of it and all that stuff. And uh, they've gone to the, the courts and it's, they've actually lost their cases, or is that not the case? No, it's not the case, actually. And, and, you know, that's not our understanding, really. It depends on how you look at them losing the case. So at this moment in time, the maritime system has the microphone. It's a little bit like, you know, the comedian in front of a room and someone shouts something out in the room. They're not heard until they get the microphone. What's going to happen naturally, and, and certainly, you know, we're, we're talking to people that have stood judges down. The moment you ask a judge if he is standing under his oath or her oath, they have to give you an answer to that. And of course, they dance because ultimately, if they are applying legislation or, or, or statutes or acts, they're not standing under their oath because they have to treat you lawfully at that point. They can't deal with a free man, they can only deal with a, a person, and a person is someone who who had uh, the, the legal fiction created at birth without consent. It's worth remembering that judges judge by consent, governments govern by consent, and police police by consent. And in reality, if you look at the structure of law, they're literally at the bottom, at the bottom level. You know, when you, when you consider who comes first, by law, it's the people. And so, you know, we are talking to people that, that stand police down pretty regularly and also have gone into court, and the, the, the most of the courts have been able to do is adjourn or shift the court. They've even got to a point where they try to run the hearing without that person present. So I think eventually what will happen as more people start to get wind of the, the real freedoms, yeah. what will happen is you will have a grown swell of opinion. And like anything, it's about numbers. It really is about numbers at that point. So would you say that you're trying to set up an alternate system to the system that's running now? Is that, is that what you're really, the long-term goal is? Well, absolutely, because the thing is, if we, if we are party to their system, the challenge, excuse me, the challenge with that is that we, we are then enslaved by it. At this moment in time, if you look at the average court, the average police organisation, they're all corporations, all limited companies. Even the MPs that you talk to, they, they, they are limited companies and, and they're there to make money. And, and who do they make money from? They make money from us. Because if you look at Black's Law, when you look at the number of, of, of um, statutes and acts that are added to, 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 that, to that document, to the book, you can see that basically this is all a system for, for squeezing even more and more money. When if you look at the, the reality of, of law, common law, 
It simply is about you as a human being, you as a, you as a, a free living person, going about your life, creating no harm or creating no loss or creating no damage. And, and, and that is its basic tenet. And, and in reality, that's not that difficult to understand. It's been made very, very complicated through the use of language. And of course, this is how maritime law was developed. And this is where it's got its power from. Because in reality, it does take someone who's very well versed in it to understand it. Mm. Interesting. So are you aware that there's, um, there's a group of uh, people called Forever, uh, Forever Family, oh, I think it's, uh, they call themselves FFF. And they are um, a group of black people that, are, that have sort of like got up their own sort of policing in their community. Would you say that you want the same sort of thing as that? Are you aware of those people? No, not, not really. But to be, to be fair, I've literally been focused on training. We start our training very shortly because we want to, we want to model um, best practice. And, and in reality, we, we would actually want the police force that are already trained, but actually aren't well versed in law, to come across and join us. We, we want police. I can't imagine a community without police, but what you want is to take it back to its, to its foundations. If you go back to the days of the Peelers, these were people that were paid by the people to protect them. You know, a police, a police person, a, police, a policeman or a police woman, they carried a whistle so that if ever they got into trouble, they would blow the whistle and the average it was the, the average citizen would, would come up and, and join them and, and assist them. I wonder how many police would get assisted in this day and age with the current climate. I, I, I don't think it'd be that many, to be honest. Um, yeah. So, because that's, that's the degradation of this situation. You know, it, this is not by chance. The government are, are, are degrading as many relationships as they can because what they want to create is a, a state of civil war. They want to create uh, separation, group against group, black against white, gay against flipping straight, you name it, that they want to create the separation. Because, you know, with, with typical dictatorships, what happens is the more separation you create, the more unrest you create, the more the people ask to be governed and controlled. So it becomes a, a pretty much a self-licking lollipop at that point. And then when governments gain power, they seldom gain power with the intention of ever releasing that power. But this is part of the process of, of um, slowly eroding, uh, you know, a, a democratic society. Mm. Yeah, no, I kind of get that because they, they are definitely using divisive um, politics at the moment. Identity politics is all about that. But this other group, this uh, Forever Family, um, they are more Marxist, I would say. Um, and obviously, I don't agree with them. Um, but they are more Marxist, and what they're trying to do is to get rid of the police altogether and to have their own community policing. And so, for example, there was an incident where... Um, there was an incident where um, a child got raped, and so they all went running around looking for the rapist, and on another occasion, a shopkeeper threw somebody out that shoplifted, and they all went around there and sort of like had a go at the shopkeeper, and try to interject themselves and i just found that more vigilante i didn't i didn't like that yeah, I thought, no, going on no, common law has its own due process and equally um it has its own it, it covers pretty much every situation and equally when it's combined with the intelligence that's, that's been gathered since uh, since the middle ages you know there's a comprehensive system for dealing with any crime i think it, it would be foolish to even contemplate going back to a situation where you ended up with groups of vigilantes going out hanging people because it becomes very biased and it becomes unbalanced on yeah. lots of levels. You know, uh, in a common law court situation, if you were accused of something, it would take 12 people to determine whether or not you were innocent or guilty. And those, those 12 people would come from the community that, that you were in. But yeah. equally, equally, you know, to actually, to, to think, you know, I work with the police, I, I, I work with the police as a personal safety public order trainer. I also work with the police in, in communication skills a number, of, a number of years ago and, and the leadership colleges. And, you know, it, it, it amazed me to see that there wasn't really a leadership model. Uh, and, uh, and of course, that came as a surprise because being military, 
you're trained for everything. We probably were the most overtrained group of people that existed. Uh, and, and so to actually think that you can just take any person off the street and turn them into a police constable um, it is not, doesn't make any sense because really what you need to do is, is you need to, to, to select hard and, and train easy and, and you want the right people for the right job, not the only people for the job. So there's always going to be selection criteria that people have to pass. But it's worth remembering, you know, that if you wanted to be a Met Police person, you could join with a criminal record as long as it was around violence. So that's an interesting concept, isn't it? So if you, so, if you, so, you can join as long as what? Well. Yeah, as long as your crime is, is, is around violence. So I could join the Met Police with ABH. Wow. So, you know, that, that doesn't come as a great surprise, because if you think about it, with some of the jobs they do with Territorial Support Group, and the Met Police, because it's a bit of a rougher environment, they don't want people that are great at talking and that can't actually enforce a situation. If you look at the, the rules of engagement, the four E's, you know, at some point you might have to, um, to you, you, you might have to enforce. Uh, so, so at that point, you want people that can enforce. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with you there because I think that what they've done, um, I know that we, we expect police officers to have a certain level of fitness, but I actually think that their, their fitness tests and, my, uh, um, and everything else has led to a situation where a lot of experienced officers as they age can't keep up the um, fitness tests and that they end up losing their jobs, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas really, because even though, even though they're probably exempt from the fitness tests, um, if they were already employed before they were brought in, you know the politics inside workplaces, they will eventually sort of push people out. Yeah. And so what you end up with, that you end up with a, a lack of experience staff. And yeah. so you, mm. you get an overturn of very, very young staff that um, quite often can't keep up with, um, with the pressure of the job. They don't really have the experience where they can fall back on wisdom to actually talk themselves out of a situation or communicate themselves well or be articulate enough with the public um, and have and, 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 and be able to read body language because a lot of people don't understand that that you know mo most of our communication skills is through body language in this country mm -hmm. but they aren't, they aren't really taught any of that you know as i looked at some of the guys that i used to teach when you started to talk about calibration which is, which is reading patterns, behavioral patterns, um, and, and sensory responses. When you start to do that kind of stuff, that's brand new to them, that's, that's news. Uh, so, so equally, if you poorly train a group of people, and equally if you don't train them in law, they, would, well, they wouldn't really know what law looks like if it bit them on the backside. So when you start to talk to some of these constables, uh, you soon find out that when you ask them about common law, they haven't got a ground in there. And that's not by chance because you, you, don't, you can't say what you don't know. And, and yet, of course, common law is the law. It is, it is the law of the land. It's the highest law. Yeah, well, a lot of it, a lot of it is common sense, isn't it? And just yeah, being able to balance, yeah. balance things up. I just yeah. want to check and see if Wendy's joined us yet. Wendy, are you here? Yeah, I've done it. Oh, okay, sorry. Have we had anybody else come join us yet? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, hi, Owen. Hi. Um, did you want to interject anything at this point? Well, I'm trying to figure out what, what, what it's about at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're, we're, we're basically talking about the Guardians 300. We created the Guardians 300. But, of course, there is an extension to that, that that's going to be uh, unleashed very shortly, and that is going to be the Angels 300, which is why Vic is here with me. Uh, because right. the Guardians 300 are going to be a, a group of peace constables that carry out specific functions. But equally, that's going to be where we guard people. Um, the, the extension to that is going to be the Angels 300. And I don't know if uh, you want to just give us a, a rough idea of what the Angels 300 is about, Vicky. <laughs> OK, I'll do my best as you <laughs> yeah. ask me to come on and prompt you. Um, so <laughs> the Angels 300 will be more about healing um, because there's been a lot of uh, emotional trauma, if you like, um, to varying degrees as a result of the measures that have been implemented by the government, you know, children are struggling, isolation, you know, seeing people with masks, um, you know, people who are now forced to work at home. There's a lot of, there's a lot of mental health issues 
coming up um, out of this last year of lockdown and, uh, and is increasing. And so um, the Angels 300 is, is <coughs> about a movement where we want to train people in transition coaching. This is emotional transition coaching. And a lot of people will be familiar with performance coaching, you know, the sort of life coaching or performance coaches that go into corporations. Um, and performance coaching is, is pretty much looking at what's going on today and helping somebody um, move it into the future. Whereas transitional coaching um, changes people's emotional relationship with their past such that they can come into the now and move into a more happier future. And we created a Spectrum Transition Coaching, which is Mick's baby. He created it in the military. Um, it's all research-based, um, it's all measured in terms of, you know, every thought that we have is driven by emotion. Every behavior that we have is driven by emotion. And there isn't anything out there that I'm aware of that actually deals with the affected domain, the emotional body. You know, we, I'm sure there's lots of people out there that would resonate with, well, I know something, but I feel this. So your mind is telling you your logic, but your feeling body is telling you something very different. So we want to um, empower people. Uh, we've, we've created a very visual journey of it to empower people to become coaches um, so that they can help their children um, or any, any child that they're working with, or even adults as well. But, you know, the children are our future and the children, they've become conditioned. You know, we're like a, we're like a, a computer. You know, we absorb all this information as we're young and it, and it develops our identity, our values and our belief system. And so um, the angels will be about um, getting people into a space where we can be empowered and, and start healing people at the level of emotion and behavior. Yeah, and of course, um, the, 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 the transition coach in itself is something that was born from me leaving the military because what I recognized towards the end of my career was that people weren't supported emotionally when they were making the transition or when they left the military. And so we created that, uh, I created that, that then, but, but, it's, but it was launched at the University of Central Lancashire in about 2013. And it was more recently placed by, uh, by some of the professors there when, when we sat down and discussed the epistemology and, and, and the application of it. It was discussed and, 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 and placed really as bridging the gap between therapy and coaching. This is what it looks like, essentially. It's a series of cards in a box. All um, right, yeah. And, and so what it, what it allows people to do is, for one, it, that they don't, you know, one of the things that I found very, very quickly with the military is that a lot of guys don't like talking about their issues. So they simply choose cards that describe their emotional states. And then what we get them to do is we get them to consider if they feel those emotions, they then get given another batch of cards and they're asked to sort of, create a link with the emotions they experience and they link them to all of these cards that have different names on them and the names are the themes of your work of, of your experience essentially so they could have childhood on they could have military operations they could have bullying they could have abuse they could have eating they could have any number of different words on those cards and what you do is you slowly build up a picture of how someone emotes and how they behave yeah. when they feel those emotions and so on these cards it, they, these will typically say things like show and swear argue withdraw self-harm and so what they're generally doing you know is, is they're building up this picture and equally we also identify their core beliefs so with the blue card uh -huh. right. they'll resonate with i'm a coward i am ugly i am not worthy i am unloved i'm alone and so from that you end up literally with a picture of where they're at so um mm. once you find someone's core beliefs yeah. right w what's the next step after that that's the emotional transition so right we take, we take them on an inward journey um because no one no one has any answers for anyone else no, so for you wendy no one's had your your parents your siblings your no you know and how you interpret an experience somebody could have been with you and, 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 and witness the same thing as you, but how you internalize that 
is mm -hmm. unique to you and how somebody else would internalize it would be unique to someone else. Yeah, I get um, that. Look, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so we simply take them on a, we kind of describe ourselves as a tour guide through a very, very <laughs> clever um, language script that takes them on a journey, allows them to trace the emotion back to the root cause, not just because often people can think that the person that's in front of them um, is, is the problem or the situation or the place is yeah. the problem. But actually when you trace the emotion back, we want to pluck it out at the roots. And generally that goes back to, we know we, we learn anger, sadness, fear, guilt, hurt, anxiety, as we are growing up, you know, and we, we learn it from those that we've chosen to pay attention to. And that's how we build up our unconscious mind at the level of identity, values, and beliefs. It's, we simply take them on an inward journey, connect with their unconscious that has all of their answers and transform the negative emotions to positive ones based on what their own answers are. And right. then we identify them. So, you know, we, we, we take them back on a journey again, get them to work out when they created that belief. We work out what emotions were present that created that belief. We change the emotions together and then we re-identify with more positive beliefs. How do we know it works? Because we measure behavior. So, um, and that's when, you know, you, you'll, you'll, you'll ask questions after, after the work, you'll get them. You know, often people say, yes, I'm, I'm over something, I'm, I'm healed, but actually what they do is they avoid. So yes. they no longer yeah. go to that place or they no longer see that person. And so actually the only way that you know that someone's actually changed is you reimmerse them in something that would have, that would have previously caused them upset. And that's when they realise they've changed because the emotions disappeared. That's how yeah. we measure it. And of course, for the academics out there, we, okay. we naturally, because it's easy to become a legend in your own mind space, um, we, also <laughs> ran, we also ran research <laughs> on site. Um, you know, we, so we've got some significant batches of research with very complex demographics, war veterans, alcoholics, drug addicts, high security prisons, uh, women's refuges. So, so yeah, it was tested in some of the most I would say complex arenas, really. And I, I mean, from a personal experience, I came across Spectrum um, four years ago, I think it was. Um, I hadn't met Nick and I was a chronic insomniac at the time. I was riddled with anxiety. I had no confidence on the inside. I had a very low self-belief system. I had a lot of negative self-talk on the inside. And um, I started my journey with Spectrum and the first theme that I did I was, I was blown away because I felt the change on the inside. And I also um, observed where my behaviors were changing as well. So, you know, often people would have looked at me and said, I saw, saw a very gregarious, very confident person. Mm -hmm. But we all know what goes on on the inside, right? Doesn't necessarily match what we project on the outside. So I was living with, with several masks, if you like. And on the inside was a very fragile, deeply sensitive, yeah. overly mm -hmm. anxious person. So... You know, I've personally experienced it as well, and um, and my family and my children, and you know, obviously, mixed work with over four thousand uh, veterans, all diagnosed with complex PTSD, and that's where the research came from. So it's, you know, it is well, it's measured and it's researched. So um, the Guardians three hundred and the angels that you're, uh, are you going to be at cost? Is this going to cost people? The Guardians cost to nothing because basically we're, we're training lots and lots of people and there's an, as a, there's an absolute necessity to get out of that, to get out of this situation with the Guardians. The, uh, the Angels is going to be a business model, it has to be, because when it comes to helping people, what I've learned the hard way is that if you don't create a business, you end up with nothing to offer. And you don't, you know, if you look at, look at any charity, look at Help for Heroes, it's one of the biggest businesses that, that mm, exists. Yeah, the that's true. World. Yeah. So if you don't have solid foundations at the level of business, what you have is a well-meaning organisation that can't really give people an experience that's going to last a long time. So, so, so essentially that will be a business model. And equally, you know, we don't just believe in teaching people to fish. We want to give them a fishing rod. So when people learn the system, they can also go out and use the system as a fully fledged coach. And they can use it at various so points. Would this all be done? Would, would the, the angels bit? Would that be done um, online, or would it be face to face? Or how, how would it, how would you how would you do it? Well, we've already delivered it online, and it works. Oh, brilliant! In a in an ideal world, you always want to face to face training because you know there's nothing like having the actual energy of the people 
in that space, but given the current situation, mm -hmm. that's not practical sometimes. Um, so yeah, we can do it online and it's, it's equally as efficient online, especially when you look at level one and level two. Level three, because it's more complex, level three, you're starting to deal with people that are suicidal, people that have had formal mental health diagnosis. Uh, so that's always better done face to face. Because yeah. Of course, those that come on on the training as well, um, they will experience their own emotional transition as part of it. Yeah. And at the end of it, you know, you will be equipped with mm. a, a significant skill set that can transition people very fast and very safely. So I had counselling, um, and from my experience of counselling, is that you end up talking a lot about your trauma, and your mm. your mind doesn't know the difference between the past and the present. And if you start talking about something that was very upsetting, it enters your nervous system and it's like you're reliving it. And if there's no mechanism for actually changing that emotion, actually, for some people that are emotionally heavy, um, going to a counselling session can actually really traumatise them and leave them in a, in a delicate space. Yeah, it can make them worse. Yeah, it can make yeah. them worse. Yeah. Whereas, you know, with spectrum transition coaching, there's no need. It was specifically no. designed to stay out of the detail for the purposes of keeping people safe. It double dissociates people. So it's as though it's, you know, they're not talking about themselves. So it keeps them out of the story. We're just interested in the emotion that was present at the time and then help them change the emotion. Oh, so right. Yeah, that's it's good. very, very effective. It requires no talking. And since we've done the cards, which takes it into a, into a sort of visual journey, Previously, the coach, and they still need um, excellent questioning skills, we would question people to work out the areas of their life where they've um, accumulated emotion and it would require the coach to be able to listen for hot words and negative impact is when they, they say, you know, they, they don't want something. And from there, they would work out the areas of their life. Well, now we simply give people a set of cards. They look through the words yeah. and they can see the word and they, they just build up the picture of their life without really much discussion. And it's amazing. And what's really quite unique about it as well, Vicky, is it's the only system that I know that's out there that when you take a baseline of how emotionally loaded someone is mm. you can do that from a very safe perspective so you can do it so that they do a self-report which is a subjective perspective and you can do it from an objective perspective because as a coach you can automatically see what where this person is in denial a lot of guys especially veterans deny you know that the operations was frightening that, that you know and, and of course People naturally deny things. Yeah, of course. It's a great system. You know, there's nothing sinister about that. But essentially, it's a great system for creating a subjective and objective assessment of where that person is at emotionally. It's fantastic for that. And also, one of the beautiful things is that, you know, those that are more... I don't necessarily want to say more complex. Those that are more laden with emotion have got more emotion in their nervous system. Um, you know, quite often people use drugs or alcohol, gambling or whatever to distract themselves from, from how they're feeling. And in sort of conventional approaches, they'll say, well, we can't treat you till you come off the drugs. We can't treat exactly, you. Exactly, yeah. Whereas we recognise yeah. that they're just a distraction and it's emotion that's driving it. And so we will work with people who are taking drugs. We will work yeah. with people that are alcoholics. And, and naturally, as, the, as their journey unfolds, their dependency upon those will change. Yep. So how expensive would a course of this therapy be, or counselling? What do you call it? Therapy, counselling? 4,000 quid. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it depends. What you, if you want to learn it as a coach, then we've got a pricing structure, and, and we're not going to do a hard... I think she's talking about... But if you're, yeah, as, as a, a client, client, as a client, you're also, it's also determined by the coach. You know, I, I, I've never... If I look at some of the some of the NLPers that were charging four thousand pounds an hour, you know, tell me about it. Yeah, you know what I mean. So I've never gone into that arena. So I, I've seldom gone beyond beyond one hundred and twenty pounds an hour for change work because change work is intense, and and change work takes quite a bit of skill. So I generally charge about one hundred and twenty pounds an hour for for change work. Now I would say that my skill set is pretty fine tuned. So I wouldn't expect a coach to be saying to me, well, you know, I'm charging £1,200 an hour. And some of them do that, to be honest. Um, and of course, some people say, well, are you charging enough? But I think 
you know, if you only ever want the people that have got the money to experience it, then then, then charge 5K <laughs> an hour. But if you actually want to open it up to, to everyday people, and by the way, you know, when I think about the numbers of people that I've treated for nothing, and one of the reasons this has got to be play, uh, based on business is that it allows us to train some people under scholarships for nothing. It allows us then to, to wheel it out to some people that don't have well, any. Uh, yeah, I was about to say, you can't really price well, price price people out, out, out of it. No, you, you can't. Know. Well, Wendy, we've, in this last year, I can tell you, you know, mixed business crashed in this last year, yeah, didn't it, darling? It, yeah, yeah. You know, and the Thank number of... Know. The number of people, I mean, it's building back up again now, well, but the number of people well, yeah. that we've travelled to to help for nothing. Yeah, yeah, I believe that. Time, you know, we've we've given we've given our heart and soul into people, you know, because um, we would never, I would never get in the way of anyone's health because they haven't got the funds. So we no. believe in energy exchanges, you know, what we pay it forward, it comes back in a different way. So yeah, yeah. Um, and I would say, you know, unless you know, for, for people on average, I would say, you know, a few sessions, people, people see a significant change. Yeah, and that's the beauty of it. So we don't do prolonged two, three year, four year relationships no. on any level. Yeah. In, no. in fact, and, and I know that this sounds a bit bold, but I can I can assure you that most of my clients don't stay with me for longer than a month as a dedicated client. They might join a training or they might join an extended group of coaches. And because we also want to introduce them to other people that do what we do. Because for me, there's there's a lot of there's a lot to be gained from meeting different people and different coaches. So mm -hmm. I'm a, I'm a great believer in, in an abundance mentality, and I think. You know, once once I've done the work with them, then they go out and they find who they're meant to find. Yeah. Um, and and if so, yeah, go on, Wendy, you, yeah. you um, what what would be the qualifications be if someone decided they wanted to to train? You know, to be um. Well, there's no prerequisite, is there, Mick? No, no. There's no prerequisite no. to come in and learn this. It's just, oh, okay. it's yeah. just a desire, a desire to effect change. I mean. You know, there's nothing more beautiful than being able to deliver this to your child. We've got great mums that are great coaches. Um, I mean, if I look at Anita, she was one of the top marketing people for uh, for um, legal in general. But so what? What she was was a great mum. And, you know, yeah. you can't underestimate with some of the girls, some of the boys that we meet with life experience. And you see, remember, we don't do psychology. So it might take you five years to become a psychologist. Well, guess what? You know, I, w I was never into psychology. It didn't mm. translate. In the, in, in the world I was in, it didn't translate. So... Oh, thank you for that, Mick. Well, yes. it just, just didn't. I, I, I even asked the person who was training me. Uh, well, hang on a minute. I said, you know, I'm, I'm an accomplished trainer in my own right. Mm. With engineering, kayaking, fencing, basketball, you name it. You know, in the Army Physical Training Corps, we did it. And I said, I'm, 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 I'm struggling how I'm going to apply what you're delivering to me to these people for the purpose of improving their psychology. Yeah. But you see, what I find, Wend, is that is that you can get people that are just well-rounded people, you give them this skill set, and they are massive as coaches. Well, I mean, yeah. I'll, I'll just use my daughter as an example. You know, I did the five-day training, uh, I think, at the time with the lady that trained me. It cost me £1,600 for that training. Mm -hmm. Now, that allowed me to go home. I was watching my daughter at 11 years old get smaller and smaller and smaller in terms of... Um, what she would do she would withdraw from lessons she wouldn't put her hand up she would stop at the first hurdle she wouldn't carry on her belief system was so low she was a mirror of me at 11 years old really and I saw it I recognized it because that's who I was and it just broke my heart because often we see qualities in other people that we don't see in ourselves and I could see this amazing young woman young lady who was who should be growing and, it, and in fact she was recoiling and um, and I was able to do spectrum with her. I mean, obviously she yeah. she she had to want to do it, and and thankfully she did. And I've watched this girl go from a child that lacked confidence, that withdrew from classes, that her, she turned a maths result from thirty five percent in six months to ninety five percent because it got rid of her anxiety around yeah. the kinds of tests. And I watched her turned into a butterfly. Now tell me a mother or a father that doesn't want that for their child, that inner confidence that yeah. is going to just pave the way. Well, and, and the great thing, Vicky, is that, you know, if you think about it, you can do that very quickly with yeah. the system because yeah. it teaches you, the system itself works the magic. 
So even with the with the level one, you're going to be out there changing mindsets, changing little blocks. And that might be all your kids need, you know, but the ones that have been really traumatized, they might need something a little bit deeper. But I mean, it caters for every eventuality, really. And it mends relationships because when, well, somebody, well, does, yeah. when, I mean, so, when somebody stops getting reactive on the inside to the things that, you know, make yeah, them react, totally. it teaches you ownership, you know, because it's my emotion. I'm reacting to you. And if it wasn't you, it would be somebody else. So I've learned that emotion. And, then, and when you stop reacting on the inside to other people, it creates more peace. Yeah. And, uh, we need oh more. yeah, definitely. Yeah, so. we all need a little bit more of that, don't we? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it, and it sounds incredible, but it also it, because it is really the change elements to it are very, very unique, um, and and they're quick. So change happens with young people very quickly. Change happens with old people very quickly. It's just that they have generally more themes to change, and then to consolidate that change when it's done. You know, when I introduced performance coaching to the British Army in two thousand and three, it worked for about 60% of the people we used it with, but it didn't for the other 40. And that's what drove me to look at something else. And, and this was that something else, really. Right, um, so the other 40, what were they, What? why Why do you think it didn't work with the other 40? They'd all, they'd all been traumatized. So ah, okay. They'd experienced things like childhood abuse, bullying, rape. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Even some of the men. Uh, which, which I know they sound horrible sort of things to say, but, but essentially this is why not having to talk about the detail of your trauma is really important. And, it, and it's what also sets this apart from trauma-focused approaches. You know, to be traumatised once is enough. And that's what makes it beautiful, really, because we don't need the detail. We can work with the emotion. If you can find the emotion and you can learn from your past experience, you're simply reteaching yourself what you should have learned then but couldn't because you were immersed. Yeah, so in, in, in this, do you have any mixtures of uh, any other methods that you've just, like, um, put into this? Or is it all your own methods? Or... Well, no, I mean, that's not true. I'm shaking my head. But what I'm saying is that, for instance, you could argue that if I, if I get you to relax slightly, that's hypnosis. Um, mm. So you could argue that because I, was a, I had my own hypnosis school, we used some of those mini techniques for getting you to go inside, to go into the mind gym, as I would call it, with the athletes. Um, so, so those are hypnotic techniques. So nothing lives in a vacuum. And, no. and equally, the power of language, you know, you, and questions. I, I learned questions from other people that were, uh, that were uh, profound uh, in, in the arena of family therapy. So nothing comes from a vacuum. What you tend to do is you tend to look at something. Does it work? If it doesn't work, don't do it. Adapt it and, and, and change your style. Until you create something on the back uh, on the backs of those guys that basically uh, gets results, and it's all about results, really. And it's also evolutionary, isn't it? You said yeah. um, so, you know something's intelligent; if it's out of date the next day. Totally, and it's evolved. It yes, evolves. Yeah. it evolves with the client. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So let's go back to the the Guardian Guardian three hundred. So yeah. the, these pe these peace people that you want. Um, I've, I've forgotten the name you called them. You call peace constables. Peace constables, yeah. 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 Um, you say that you want a lot of these, but what kind of people are, are you advertising for people to join you? Or yeah, yeah, we want them to join us on the Telegram, on the Guardians three hundred discussion. Uh, if they tap that in, they'll find us on Telegram. And anyone that wants to join, just that the love of giving their energy is fantastic. But we're not. So we've got women who, who are going to stand as peace constables. We've got men who are going to stand as peace constables. We want people that can articulate the thoughts. We want people that are prepared to stand as part of a group to, de to defend the community, to, to keep businesses open. And if you're that type of person, fantastic. Equally, you might not necessarily be the person that wants to speak, but you might be the person that wants to stand. So mm. whether you're male, whether you're female, I mean, we are looking for people that are over the age of 18, you know, so that we... So we stay within the law in terms of, of, of what we can do. But um, but essentially, if you're up for that, then join us. And what kind of qualities would you expect in the people that you would like to join? Or is it just anybody? You can train anybody. We want peaceful, peaceful people, essentially. And we can, we can give you the knowledge and the skills to deliver what we need you to deliver and what we need you to do. And we can train you in the behaviours. But the last thing we want is to be getting into fights or doing anything that's illegal or unlawful. Yeah. The last thing we want. This will not be won by creating more division. It will be won by actually collaboration and using peace to win it. 
with, with the power of numbers. You know, I would say the people that are going to come forward, they've got to be passionate about their community. Yeah, they they've do. They've got to be passionate yeah. about keeping those small businesses open yeah. because, you know, having that community, sometimes even just for... Well, you know, I'm brave. They've got to be brave yeah, as well. Courage, yeah, yeah, courage, yeah, courage. bravery. Yeah, you know, but keeping those communities open, for some, for some people there, mm. you know, just being able to walk down to the shops and meet people is enough for them to keep them going in the day. So, you know, and these are people's livelihoods that have been in, impacted... And so, you know, why should it be that Tesco's can sell stationery and cards and flowers, and yet your your small shop that can hardly even house anybody in the shop yeah. isn't allowed to be open? Yeah, um, right. You know, so it's, it's the big right. it's the big organisations that are winning out of this, and we're losing yep. our we're, we're in danger of losing our communities if we don't stand up for them because people don't know what they can do. They don't know the power of of just understanding common law. So, so listen, ladies, I know that uh, I, I did mention to Jason that we could only be on for about 45 minutes because I've not got a meeting with our fellows, uh, our fellow patriots from across the pond. Um, so is it okay yeah. if we call it a, a day where we're at, is there anything that you'd like to finish on? Or So you said you're on Telegram. Yeah, um... we're on Telegram. So t Telegram for the Guardians 300 discussion mm -hmm. and the angels will appear on, on Telegram um, once we've got the foundations in place. So we can we can then furnish people with the kind of information that they would need to engage with us. But it'll also be on Telegram. Okay. And okay. I've also got your details from um, Jason. So if in the future, you know, we might catch up with you and invite us on to Wendy Wu's um, show that we both co-host. Sure. Um, so you can come on and reach out to we, we have quite a big audience that come and listen to us. So if you if you could come on there maybe in the future and talk a little bit more about it, because well, it just sounds like you've hit on quite a good idea. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, it's all about the results, right? So the bottom line is when we start to train people and they start to help people with regards to the angels, then that, that really is going to be the proof of the pudding, isn't it? Yeah. Well, yeah, the angels, um, it's very interesting. I think Jupiter's... Um, Going for the um, peacemen or whatever the, the peace constables, yeah. And uh, I'm more, I, I'm like going on the angels' side, yeah. That's it, when and you know, the angels is going to take off because let's face no, it's it, the angels I'm actually interested in this. Oh, you know, right. together, together, we are the guardian angels, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, listen, ladies, I'm really sorry, but I've got to go, yeah. I'm okay, love, it's late. Is that okay? Yeah, All it's right. fine. Yeah, of course. Lovely talking to you, Jupiter. Lovely talking to you, Wayne. Yeah. Yeah. All right, care. love. Thank All you. All right, you take care. care, right? Have a good Bye. evening. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.